let's see, let's make sure that the chat is open and it is. And I still have forgotten to change my picture from a picture of my child. Uh, so ignore that. God, I don't know what I'm doing. But we're going to do this. So first off, welcome everyone. Um, this is uh, this is um, a really, really exciting Zoom that I'm so excited about because I have a lot of questions about this amazing book. And we have um, an amazing author with us. It's just, I'm, mm, I'm so excited. Um, and I have so many questions. Uh, and before, before we get started, I'm going to say, let's see, uh, housekeeping would be, um, oh, if you have any questions, there's a little thing there, uh, a little thing at the bottom that says Q&A. Um, feel free to leave any questions there. And if I get, um, if I, if I get through all of mine, which is very possible because I'm super flighty today, then, uh, and, and if I've missed any, you can drop them in there. Um, let's see this. I also wanted to show y'all, um, because I don't think everybody got to see, but so this is what my book looked like. Oh, um, you have the arc. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, so, so what's really fun is that when, when I'm picking books for Fantastic Strangelings, there's like several things that I'm looking for. And, um, but as I'm going through, usually I'll go through, we'll have like these, you know, big piles of, of all the, the, the arcs, advanced reading copies. And I'll go through and I'm always like, oh, that sounds like a good title. Let me, and I'll read the first couple of pages and I'm like, okay, yeah, maybe. And, the, and this book, there's nothing, right? There's like, like, it's just, there's no, and I thought, is that a good idea? Like you've wasted all the marketing. And then I thought, but I really am so interested now. And then you open it up and, and I was, I was hundred percent hooked. And I was like, this seems like, this seems like a terrible idea. It was brilliant. <laughs> good job. Whoever designed this. And it actually, I don't know if you guys can see it. It looks, it has like the, the actual field notes. Like it looks like mm -hmm. it would be her, her real journal and the, yeah. I love the design so much. I'm going to have to pass on your compliments to the, to the design team of that arc. <laughs> oh my gosh. So smart. Did you have any, any say in that or in the cover or in any of the, the art? Yeah. I mean, usually authors are given um, a certain amount of latitude to suggest revisions and changes and to provide our feedback on the covers. But yeah, this time I also had the opportunity. I've never had like special editions done for any of my books before where you get that kind of special cover treatment and, and special arc sent out. But yeah, they did ask me for some feedback. Um, they told me kind of what direction they were thinking of going in with having something that kind of looked like Emily's journal. Um, and then you kind of slide the cover off and it's of course the book underneath. And I just told them that I absolutely love that idea. And I love the little illustration on the back, which looks like um, an illustration from like a kind of early 1900 sort of textbook. Yeah, with like, like the fairies there. So mm -hmm. I just love that so much. And a little quote from the book. So oh my gosh, yeah. I just thought yes. it was perfect. Oh, so good. And it reminds me of, and we're gonna get into fairy tale. So you know what? I will table that question. And instead I will go to, um, I will go to the sheet of paper that had all my, uh, questions on it. <laughs> Weird. Um, so we're gonna, <laughs> we are gonna, we can just wing it. <laughs> we have to wing it. We may have That's to. That's totally wing fine. It. We'll okay, both be so, winging it. <laughs> so why this book? What, what inspired you to write this book? Yeah, so I mean, the book um, actually kind of began in failure. So I was actually working on a middle grade proposal for my um, my other publisher, which is Balser and Bray, who have published all of my middle grade and YA fantasy novels. And the, the proposal was for a book about a girl that ends up living in fairyland and she ends up wanting to stay there. And in order to stay there, she has to kind of prove herself. She has to prove that she has the magic to stay in that world. And it was an idea that I was really excited about, but for whatever reason, the idea just kind of kept just dying on the page. Like I was just getting stuck over and over and over again, no matter what direction I 
took the story in, I would just get stuck. And I was really spinning my wheels and procrastinating as I tend to do when I don't want to admit to myself that a story isn't working, but it really isn't working. Um, I have like this denial phase. And so I was kind of flipping through the main book that I was using for my research, which was An Encyclopedia of Fairies by Catherine Briggs, who was this folklorist, um, I think it was back in the early 70s that she published this kind of textbook, which is just basically documenting all of the known fairy species in the British Isles. And she just kind of roamed around, just kind of collecting stories from people. And I remember just kind of flipping through the book and just thinking like, what would it have been like to have written something like this? Like that must've been such a cool experience. And that was really where the kind of the seed for Emily Wilde came from, even though I didn't actually end up writing the book until several years later. I didn't have the characters, I didn't have the plot or any of the other pieces, but yeah, that was really where it began with that kind of failed <laughs> middle grade proposal. And the result was this um, adult book that is now out in the world, which is super awesome. Was it hard going from middle grade to adult or was it easier? Um, no, it was hard. <laughs> yeah, like I wish, yeah, I wish I could be kind of coy and say like, oh no, I've, I've always just, you know, I've always been able to write across different categories. But yeah, it was, it was a struggle for a while. Like I actually spent um, several years just kind of like flailing and just kind of like spinning my wheels and trying to write, like I had a bunch of different ideas for different projects. And I would kind of like send them to my editor as like a proposal. And she was so polite and so kind. She just kind of been like, you know, there's some things that are good here, but I think you might want to take another shot at it. Um, you know, your voice is sounding a little bit YA still because I actually started off writing YA. Like I, my debut novel was um, Even the Darkest Stars, which is the first book in a fantasy duology. So yeah, I just, I was, um, really stuck for a number of years. And then I didn't really know why I was stuck though, but eventually I realized that it was basically because I had this kind of narrative in my head where I was telling myself that if I was gonna write for adults, it had to be dark. Like I had to be writing dark themes. There had to be a kind of grittiness there. There had to be, you know, violence. And the characters had to have these kind of psychological wounds that they were wrestling with. Like we've all probably read fantasy novels. Um, of that nature, that kind of grim, dark sort of fantasy, um, which was, I mean, like intellectually, like I knew that that wasn't true. Like I knew that there were lighthearted books out there for adults, but I think probably partly too, I was just kind of maybe self-conscious about being kind of in the children's realm and then kind of taking that leap into adult and really wanting to tell myself that, okay, you really have to differentiate yourself from your middle grade, which tends to be more like I tend to like a lot of whimsy and a lot of fun and sort of humor in my books, but I had this idea that, well, I can't do that if I'm writing for adults. And yet that is kind of my natural inclination. So it really wasn't until, I think this was like early in the pandemic when I was just looking for something really kind of like light and fun, which probably I think a lot of us were at that time. And I went into my bookstore, um, my local bookstore, and I found a copy of TJ Clune's The House in the Cerulean Sea, which I don't know how many people out there have read, but it's just, it's an amazing book and it's so funny and it's so full of heart and so full of whimsy and so kind of like weird and offbeat and wonderful. And I just was kind of like, okay, I'm allowed to do this. <laughs> like, this is allowed. Like, this is something that you can do in adult fantasy. And of course, TJ Klune has been just so successful with that book, um, understandably so. So I really do think that there is like an appetite for it within the adult realm. And yeah, that was kind of where it started and, and <laughs> with the story of how I kind of spun my wheels for, for a number of years, but eventually I figured out um, that I was allowed to kind of do the kind of storytelling that I naturally gravitate towards as a writer. But, you know, it's interesting because um, as I was reading it, I kept trying, I was like, okay, what does this remind me of? This reminds me of something and I cannot place it. And it wasn't until the second time that I read it that I was like, oh, it reminds me of Terry Pratchett. It has that oh, same yeah. like mm -hmm. fun, like it doesn't take itself too seriously, but it's still dark and it's, it's, it's got, it's not afraid to, to make you laugh. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and that was, uh, that was to me, one of the, the biggest, the biggest thing. And we'll, we'll talk a, a little bit more about the book itself. And, and I will tell everybody spoiler in, in a few minutes, once we do start getting into the actual book itself. Um, but let's talk first about 
Uh, so I'm assuming you are too, maybe you're not, but I am a enormous fan of fairy tales. And I probably, I started counting actually <laughs> earlier today and I got, I got to 75 uh, fairy tale books that I have in my shelves and then stopped and, and, and envious. You know, right. And I, I used to <laughs> feel really kind of embarrassed about it because people would come over and they'd be like, Oh, you're a child. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and then I would, you know, encourage them. I'd be like, have you actually read, you know, the blue fairy book? Have you actually read Duloc's, you know, ice cream? Have you actually read? And mm -hmm. it's really, it's fucking dark. It's dark. It's, it's all blood in the shoes and the, everybody's dying and everybody's <laughs> losing, lopping off limbs. And, um, so that's, that's, uh, that's, something that I've always loved is that what's what are your feelings about fairy tales yeah I also love fairy tales um which will probably I would assume come as no surprise to anyone listening um but yeah absolutely and I think that that that's kind of one aspect of fairy tales that I love is that they are um like they're children's stories on the one hand and on, on the one hand they read as children's stories um and yet on the other hand they have this darkness about them like all of them really do and I mean I think <laughs> one of my favorite fairy tales is is the kind of the bluebeard um fairy tale and I mean that's about as dark as you can get that's about a guy that just like keeps murdering his wives like <laughs> And I mean, you know, and Red Riding Hood, like Red Riding, Little Red Riding Hood has a similarly kind of dark um, undercurrent to it. Um, there's like undercurrents of like pedophilia in like some of the original stories. And it's just really creepy stuff. Um, and so, you know, fairy tales, they do have this kind of inherent darkness about them. But there's also a kind of like a whimsy and a kind of fun aspect to them as well. Um, and just about all the different iterations that have been that have been made out of these stories and all the different kind of inspiration that authors have drawn from them over the over the decades and the centuries. So yeah, I don't know, they're just they're very rich kind of soil as an author to kind of to kind of play with. And I love that that about them really. The um I love the the idea not only that, like especially if you're reading like fairy tales from Holland and fairy tales from France and for, and they all have a similar a similar way in which they're told um and they all have a, a similar um a similar puzzling uh a similar like a, a and and actually you know what i'm going to pause that um because we're going to get to that and then it's going to be some spoilers so i'm not going to get to that yet but instead i'm going to say wait what was the thing i was going to say i haven't taken my agd meds this is probably <laughs> going to seem very, very obvious. Oh, I was going to say that the great thing about fairy, fairy tales and same thing with like um, myths and uh, like Greek and Roman and is, is you're reading it and they're like, and then all of a sudden this person turned into a duck, blah, 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 blah. And, and you just go with it. You're just like, okay, that person's a duck now. Um, and, <laughs> and I think it's so fantastic how there are, there's just no rules. Mm -hmm. um, and so is that freeing or is that when you're writing something that has to do with fairyland and fairy tales, is that freeing or is it harder because you could feel self-conscious about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that that really is is also just the reason why I'm so drawn to writing fantasy um, is because there is that sense of kind of no rules. Um, you know, like I've been asked before, like, well, why fantasy? And like, why were you so, you know, interested in fantasy when I was a child? Because I really did start off reading fantasy. That was my main genre. And it's the genre that I've kind of stuck with the most over the years. And if you look at kind of my, my reading list on Goodreads over like the course of a year, probably over 50, 60% of the books that I read are in the kind of SFF genre. So yeah, I mean, that's what I love to read and it's what I love to write. And I do really think that there is something about that kind of like no boundaries aspect to the genre where you can just kind of let your imagination go literally wherever you want. Like you can create a world that's like set in the clouds if you want to, and you can design, you can kind of design an architecture around there of, of like rules and magic and, and all the rest of it. And I absolutely love that. Like world building is probably one of my favorite aspects of storytelling. I absolutely love like when I first get an idea, just kind of sitting down and like drawing a map of the world and just like figuring out where everything is and where everything would go. So yeah, I love kind of not being bounded by, by anything. Although 
I will say like there is a caveat in that in that when you're creating a magic system, it does have to have some rules and some boundaries. Um, otherwise, everything is just way too easy and you can solve every problem with a spell. So I guess the, the idea of no rules is a bit illusory, but I do think that it, it generally applies to fantasy. And that's why I love it so much. So, okay, so we're going to talk about the actual book now. So, so uh, just a, a, a warning in case you haven't finished it. Here, there may be spoilers. I'm not sure how far we're going to go into it. We're probably going to get pretty far into it because I have questions. Um, so, so just FYI, if you haven't um, finished it and you're afraid, and there aren't any spoilers, but there might be enough. Uh, so if um, if you want to pause it, uh, we'll have it up on YouTube. Uh, usually, it just takes us a couple of days to put it up. Um, okay, so, so first off, the... Um, the uh, the uh, what is the word that I'm looking for? So like the the like academia of fairies. Um, at as I'm going through, like because I mean I know a fair amount. Um, so there was a lot that I recognized that I was like, oh yeah, the difference between a brownie and oh this is a grim and oh this is a. Um, but there was a lot that I was like, oh I didn't know that I didn't know that. How much of that was from your own imagination, and how much of that came from research yeah a lot of it a lot of it definitely was um either from my own imagination or it was from research that I kind of twisted and kind of slotted into where what I needed for the story um so I mean probably again my primary source of research for kind of devising the categorization system of the folk was from an encyclopedia of fairies by Catherine Briggs so that's where a lot of the terminology comes from that's where a lot of the kind of brownies bogarts etc that's where I drew those ideas from um but yeah I did kind of want to kind of make my own sort of style of fairy folklore and my own kind of architecture of where these different creatures fit in. Um, so I did kind of juggle different ideas. So for instance, the common, like the, the idea of like the trooping fairies versus kind of the more solitary fairies, that was from um, William, Butler, William Butler Yeats. He actually put together this kind of um, just, just a sort of compilation of like fairy stories from Ireland. And I believe that that was where he kind of made that kind of distinction, which I thought was really fun. So I was really drawing from a number of different sources of folklorists and people that have been really engaged in kind of like the fairy folklore space. Um, but yeah, I also just kind of like let my imagination sort of have free reign and just devise my own kind of system of, of how I wanted these fairies to be and how I wanted them to behave. And I really have always liked the idea of having like sort of two, two main subspecies of fairies, the, the kind of the courtly fairies, the human-like fairies, and the kind of little brownie type fairies which is cheating a little bit because if you look at the different folklores of like different regions, not every region has this kind of idea of these kind of like dual like fairy species. So for instance, in, in Iceland, which is one of the one of the folklores that I was inspired by, um, there's really just the hidden ones who are these kind of human-like fairies that you very rarely encounter. Um, when you're out and about. And so there aren't really like the little species there, but I really wanted to have kind of like both both kind of um, the ideas of like both kinds of fairies that we see throughout the folklore of Europe and other parts of the world. So I just kind of did that because <laughs> that was what made sense to me and that was what I wanted to do. And I did kind of want to put my own stamp on fairy folklore and not kind of follow anyone else's blueprint too closely. Well, I think you, I think you did it really well. It reminded me a lot of, um, uh, what is it called? Midsummer Night's Dream. You know, there's that whole fairy lore and then Neil Gaiman sort of twisted it with Sandman. I don't know if you've ever read like all of his um, Sandman stories, but he goes so far into the different realms of what if these characters were real and how would glamour really work and what would it happen if a fairy did fall and how and the, and um, to me this was a, so this had a, the, a very similar sort of feeling to it, which I really mm. appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I have. I'm gonna have to read Sandman. I I love Neil Gaiman and I love so many of his books, but I've never read the Sandman comics. I always oh feel guilty of admitting that. <laughs> here's the problem: is wait, I'm gonna look and see. okay. So if you see see the, this book that starts here, and then it goes mm -hmm. all of these books here to right there, that's all Sandman. Oh so you're gonna be reading for a long time, <laughs> which is so good because it's so, 
it's fantastic. <laughs> but um, yeah, you're going to be reading for go to the library. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It sounds like it's a worthy investment in time. <laughs> oh so, so good. So good. Highly recommended to anybody who hasn't. Ooh, okay. Well, come on. I guess you can come over here then. Anybody oh. who has, this is Ferris Mueller. Say hi. Um, anybody who hasn't read it, highly recommend it. Uh, let's see. So let's talk a little bit about, um, so for me, horror is my main genre um, that's like my absolute favorite. And the one that I tend not to get into is romance. And so I was really surprised how much I loved this book because it is like, it was, the banter was great. The dialogue was great. It had a very, um, to me, it felt like it had a very Jane Austen kind of sarcastic, will they or won't they, um, you know, slightly uptight, but also like, oh, passion. And then, um, <laughs> Was it, how, how do you do your dialogue? Because <laughs> it's really good and I want to do that too. So, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, like I love, I love writing banter. That's probably one of my favorite things to write. Um, so the, the kind of secret to banter is really just coming up with characters who are the, per the perfect sort of complementary opposites. Um, so you want to have characters that will get on each other's nerves. Um, so there's got to be things about each other that annoys the other character. Um, and their personalities have to be like ideally opposites. But again, I, I use the word complementary opposites because they do have to kind of make a really good team. Um, I think that's really where the magic happens. I think that if you can come up with, with that type of pairing, um, if you kind of just throw the characters together and you really kind of know them well as an author too, um, the banter just kind of happens, at least it does for me, because it's just like, you know, having them just put them in a room together and have them butt heads and the banter just kind of naturally ensues. Um, and so for me, like obviously Emily, Emily is the character that I came up with first. Um, and she is like an example of my, one of my favorite character archetypes, which I don't know if there's like an official name for this, but I just kind of think of it as like the socially inept genius archetype. And I absolutely love characters that fit into that, into that kind of framing. Um, I was a Trekkie when I was a kid. I absolutely love Star Trek and one of my all-time favorite Star Trek series. Well, actually I had two. I love Voyager and I love Next Gen. And Thank each you. of those series, yeah, each of those series has one of these, these characters in it, right? I think that Voyager, the best example I can think of is probably Seven of Nine. Um, and then of course, in Star Trek Next Gen, we've got Data. And, um, and probably like a more modern recent example would be um, in like the BBC's production of Sherlock with Benedict Cumberbatch. We have a more kind of like sociopathic leaning example of that character archetype. But I just really love that type of personality. Um, it's like, maybe it's the kind of opposition kind of inherent in that character where they're just, they're so good at this particular realm of their life, of the intellectual realm, but they just can't make conversation with anyone without ticking them off. Like there's just something there that's inherently interesting to me. So like, I've always wanted to kind of have a book that centers that type of character. And of course, when I was thinking about that character, I was like, well, who, who would really be a great, kind of person for that character to kind of bounce off in, in interesting ways. And Wendell Bambleby was just kind of the natural um, kind of end point of that sort of wondering, like who would Emily's ideal opposite be? Because he really is her opposite in almost every way. Um, and so, yeah, when you kind of put them together, the banter just kind of happens. Um, and that's always really fun. And again, that's my favorite part of the writing process. So you've got to have those two kind of those two kind of characters kind of there as sort of the, the groundwork and then the banter will result naturally. At least it does for me. Uh, so Jessica brought up and um, I think it's a good point because I kind of thought the same thing as I was reading it. I was like, you know, you can read her as neurodivergent. You could read her as, you know, just extremely um, uh, introverted. Um, and I, I think in a way that, um, that, that so many people can relate to her as either feeling like her or knowing someone like her um were you at all worried that because in some cases she can come off a little unlikable you know because she is a very she's very rigid and she's very and she's you know not really sure how to and it, it's not until 
you know, really toward the end that you start to feel like, oh my gosh, I love her. And, you know, and um, were you worried that people wouldn't take to her? Mm. Um, I think uh, not really, to be honest, because I, I think probably part of this is just the fact that like when I'm writing, I like I've been asked before, like what, you know, what kinds of um, audience am I writing for or what do I hope people will kind of take away from my writing? And honestly, I, I mostly write for myself, like first and foremost, when I'm when I'm telling a story. And so really when I'm writing, I'm kind of asking myself, well, what would I like to see in this story and from this character? And so I always, um, again, I've always wanted to write a character like Emily. And I love the idea of that kind of character, which I don't think we normally, I mean, there are some examples of like female examples of that archetype, but I think generally um, it's, you see it more in like male characters. And so I really like the idea of having kind of like that sort of prickly genius um, character represented in, in Emily, in, in a woman. And so, yeah, I was just personally really excited to write a character like that. And I sort of have always liked Emily and I've always had a really kind of understanding for who Emily is as a person. So that was kind of the idea, the worrying about how people would, would take her was kind of secondary. Um, it did happen like after I finished, but fortunately when my agent, I remember she read the story and she was like, oh, I absolutely love like how prickly she is. Like, that's my favorite thing. And it actually became, in a weird way, it was a selling point for the book. Like whenever we would talk to editors, like we had a few different editors interested in the book um, initially, and they all said the same thing. They were all like, I love prickly characters, like especially prickly female characters. We don't see enough of those. We wanna see more. And so it actually was something that helps my book sell more easily, like weirdly enough. Um, so yeah, so I, I didn't really, I didn't really have any issues with Emily's prickliness, at least early on. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, you know, uh, one of the words that you use to describe her right up front is curmudgeonly. And as a matter of fact, I don't even think, I want to say it was maybe, it was maybe in the summary I read, but it was something about like, you know, it starts with a, you know, curmudgeonly professor. And in my head, I'm like, okay, so this dude, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm like, oh, wait, the girl is a curmudgeonly professor? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get, so yeah, it worked. Awesome. Um, let's see. Let, let me look on my, I'm going to look on my phone notes uh, because I've lost my other notes. So uh, let's see. Okay. So there were some, some little things that I saw that I was like, I'm not sure if I'm reading in more on this than there really is, or if this, or if these really were little, little asides, but um, I kept finding all of these little things like uh, in the the wedding when um, he makes her the wedding shoes and they're the fur lined slippers and I was like that's what the real Cinderella had um, and so I was like oh is that is that you know and there were there were just a couple of other like the oh, when you talked about like the 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 goblin fairs and the, and then I was like oh it's like the goblin market the you know the poem and the bell and the oh and the, and Am I am I reading in too much? Were those were those little shout outs to dumb people <laughs> like me who read all the old fairy tales? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that is definitely so I do I do quite often like to include little Easter eggs when I'm writing. So yeah, I definitely do think that those were kind of like um little references to different um different stories and and in the case of the Goblin Market poems that I that I myself absolutely love and have always loved. Um, so yeah, and also, I mean, I just, when I was writing the book, um, the idea of story and of storytelling is really kind of a fundamental theme, um, largely because that is in many ways how the folk kind of shape their own world, which is an idea that when I, when I had it, I, it just really fascinated me, just the idea of these, these creatures that kind of almost like their code of law is almost like stories, like what has happened in stories. And that kind of really guides their behavior and it kind of guides their culture and the way that they make decisions. So, I mean, again, I guess I'll put a little spoiler warning up before I say this, but like the main reason why um, Emily's or why Wendell's stepmother is unable to get Wendell out of the way is because um, that would sort of close the door to her defeat. And there needs to be that possibility of her being overthrown as there is in every fairy story, right? Like every monster, no matter how terrible, no matter how bad, there has to be a way 
to kill the monster, to overthrow the tyrant. Um, even if it's difficult, there has to be that that way out in every fairy story. Um, and so I really just kind of was playing really with the idea of story as I was writing. And that's why you will see that there are um, like layers and, and references to um, stories that I personally love and stories that I've um, been inspired by um, within the book. So thank you for noticing that. <laughs> that makes me feel, that makes me feel smart. <laughs> um, the, I loved the awareness of you know, you talked about the, the the rules and the way that I'd love to the awareness that Emily shows of of the fact that there are rules. Um, the you know she when she had the, the three questions to ask instead of asking all three, she was like, okay, the third question in a story is always the most important, so I should not ask this question because I'm probably going to need to ask a question later on. Or um, I, there there was another oh when when it was like. She was like, oh, this is easy. All I'm going to do is just, I'm going to, uh, spoil. by the way, lots of spoilers here now. I'm just going to poison the king. Here we go. This is an easy. And she's like, this doesn't feel like the right ending. And if this is not the right ending, this is going to take us on a darker ending. Um, mm -hmm. And I love that idea of, of self-awareness of the, and, you know, things coming in threes and the, like, just the, the rules that are, that are both done out loud and quietly I thought it I thought it was just it was really really well done just <laughs> thank you thank you mm. so looking looking at my notes which make no sense at all because they're, <laughs> they're me I mean this literally says a bikini hound I think that means the black hound I think this is <laughs> talking about shadow okay so <laughs> loved Loved, loved Shadow. Um, loved everything about him. I want more of his story. Is there going to be more of? I want to know more about about Shadow. <laughs> about Shadow. Yeah, there Shadow. I mean, I don't know how much I can give away of book two, which, by the way, is finished. Um, it's with the copy editor right now. So, yeah, it's it's on the way. Um, but yeah, Shadow Shadow will be back, of course. Um, anyone who's worried about Shadow, Shadow Shadow is fine. Um, he will be back for a fairly large role in book two. So yeah, and and I mean, I would like to to kind of delve more into his story as well and kind of the bond that he has with Emily and how they met and all of those things. And so I'll just say that yes, more more information is to come. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. And then, uh, and, and um, Megan has my next question, which is, and Wendell's terrible cat, or will we know more about <laughs> Wendell's terrible cat? Because I want to know everything about his terrible cat. Well, I mean, as someone who also has a terrible cat, um, who I'm absolutely astonished that she hasn't uh, interrupted me <laughs> so far. Um, but yes, there will be, there will be more information on Wendell's ter terrible cat. <laughs> So good, so good. Um, loved all the characters. Loved the the family building of it, um, and and especially the the idea of the of the maid family of the you know that Poe became her family. That you know these people who she had previously kind of cut herself off to became her family, and and that you know she and Wendell, even though they are both like adorable and fantastic and I love them but they're also like very selfish both of them are like really selfish people um mm -hmm. but but in the end they're still like oh I guess we have to do the right thing even though like I love that they stop and think every time every time that 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 Wendell's like why don't we just pretend we went out to rescue them and it was just too hard and then we come back and I love that she's not immediately like you ass of course for she's like we could do no. Yeah. Let no. me think about it for a minute. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> Which I feel like like we would all like we would all do, right? I mean, like that's that's hard. Like going out into the wilderness and, and rescuing someone from these horrible, terrifying fairies. Like we would all have that thought, I think. And so yeah, that that kind of honesty in Emily and Wendell was um was was fun for me to play with as well. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so let's see. So we have questions in the Q&A that I want to make sure that I get to. Let's see. So when does book number two come out? Um, because we absolutely love this book. Oh, thank you. Any, yes. Any thoughts on hub date? 
Um, I believe we're targeting um, a year after the first one. So yeah, so it should be like, I haven't actually checked this recently, but it should be January of next year. Um, and I do have a title um, and it is of course, Emily Wilde's Map of the Otherlands. So that was recently announced on Instagram and I will have like some more information um, coming soon, some more little um, Easter eggs and spoilers, um, hopefully not too, too severe, but yeah, I will have more information and, and little clues uh, coming over the next few months. So yeah. Very exciting. Uh, let's see. All right. Cassidy asks, do you ever impress yourself with the quiet moments of dialogue you create? Um, such as you are not so terrible in you merely need friends who are dragons like you. Mm. Yeah, thank you. That's a really sweet question. Um, that, yeah, that's one of my favorite lines in the book, I think. Um, because I mean, I think that all of us, we can kind of relate to Emily on some level. Um, I mean, Emily kind of shares my kind of introverted qualities. I don't like to write characters that are kind of self-insert characters because I like to write about people who are different from me, but every character that I write has some degree of, like there's some overlap in the Venn diagram between their personality and mine. And yeah, Emily definitely has my introversion. And I think that like, we can all kind of relate to that sense of, of not fitting in in certain situations of kind of being the outcast. And I think that Emily feels that particularly acutely just because of the nature of who she is and what she's chosen to value in her life. And so, yeah, I mean, in terms of whether or not, whether or not I impress myself, I don't know. I don't want to sound like I have a big head, but there are absolutely moments where I'll just kind of like quietly be like, oh, I really like that. That's really good. I'm really impressed with myself on some level. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I mean, I do have those moments sometimes, but, um, but yeah, but that's okay. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. I also, I really loved that, um, that, 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 that Wendell would kind of continually come back and call her a dragon, which I think, mm -hmm. because so often in those sort of, you know, relationships you expect them to be like oh my little kitten oh my little you know because he's so powerful and he's magic and instead his terms of endearment are dragon which is not mm -hmm. one you normally hear and I I just I loved that it's such a great, oh, great thank play. you uh let's see Janie asks are you a plotter or a pantser I am a planter. I think that's, that's the word that I've come up with. That's my little portmanteau. Um, I, yeah, I started off as a plotter and I was really kind of anal about it. Like I would have these incredibly detailed outlines um, down to like word count targets for specific scenes. Um, but somewhere along the way, I just kind of found that I was feeling a little bit hemmed in by having kind of that level of detail to kind of guide me through the story. Um, that being said, I do like to have some degree of outline. So I will have like maybe a one to two page kind of summary of where I'm thinking of taking the story. Um, so I do need some degree of, of kind of map to kind of guide me through, but it's a lot looser than it used to be. And also I've kind of given myself permission to diverge from, from the path that I've kind of devised when I'm sitting and coming up with my outline which I think has been good because um, I found that some of my best ideas come to me when I'm actually writing. I do have most of my ideas when I'm plotting. I do still have that kind of plotter tendency, but having more of a free kind of mindset when it comes to actually sitting down and doing the draft has been really helpful for me. And I've come up with some really good ideas that way. So yeah, I am I would say planter for sure. <laughs> was, it, was it hard? Um, as I read it, I kept forgetting about the fact that it is written in journal form. And every mm -hmm. time I was like, I'd get to the end of the of the chapter and it would it would bring it back and I'd be like, oh, I'm reading this in journal form. And I'd be like, that was so well done. Like there's there's never a time where I would I would go and I would be like, wait, did she ever talk about things that she wouldn't have known? No, no. And then mm -hmm. and then, you know, Wendell would get in there and he'd write his stuff and the um right. was that. Was that helpful to you or was it, that seems like it would be incredibly difficult. <laughs> yeah, the epistolary novel format is kind of, it's definitely kind of a weird one. It's a, it's a strange beast. Um, and I've never written an epistolary novel before. So, and I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. Like I remember I started writing the book and I wrote a few pages. And at one point I was just kind of like, huh, okay, this is an epistolary novel. Like it just, it, that's kind of the format that it was taking. It sounds like it's it's something that she's writing in her journal. So I just kind of went with that, just thinking, oh, well, you know, epistolary novel, that's like, you know, first person 
narrative. That's the same thing. That'll be easy. But it was actually really, um, really challenging. So um, just kind of like, because when you're writing an epistolary novel, you're kind of having to keep in mind sort of like two timeframes. Like there's, of course, the events that are unfolding in that particular entry. But then there's also like, well, where is the character when they're writing it? Like where, what's their situation when they're, when they're sitting there drafting that entry out? Um, and also just with pacing as well, like trying to kind of keep in mind, okay, how am I going to sustain tension? Like I can't have cliffhangers because like who sits down to write a journal entry and they just stop in the middle of like, I don't know, they're attacked by a wolf or something. Like nobody would put the pen down at that point. So like some of the little writer tricks that I had had relied on over the years were just kind of out the window when you write epistolary. Um, so yeah, it was definitely a challenge, but um, I do feel like it, it is the best format that suits the story. And it was kind of interesting because you do get kind of like an additional insight into the character um, that you don't necessarily get even with close first person, because of course it's the character who's not only narrating, but they're also describing like what goes into the story and what kinds of things they're going to write about. So that is interesting, trying to kind of wrestle with that and figure out, well, would Emily actually focus on this or would she be thinking about this thing over here? Um, so yeah, so you do get more insights into characterization through the epistolary format, but I'm not gonna lie, it was definitely a struggle at the beginning for me because it was just so new and so different. <laughs> well, you did it well. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Michelle says, um, when you are creating the fairies and their worlds, in your mind, do you write the descriptions directly from your imagination? Do you sketch it? Do you storyboard it? Um, yeah, I'm not really a very visual person in terms of like sketching. Um, so I don't usually do that, partly probably also because I'm just absolutely terrible at drawing. Um, so I don't think that would really help me at all. <laughs> if anything, it would just discourage me. Um, so no, I don't really, I don't really do that. Um, I mostly just kind of take notes and just kind of describe things um, kind of like to my, in my, in my head, I, I visualize things, but I don't really storyboard at all. Um, so Kelly, had, this is such a good question. Did you travel to, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this, to Norway, let's just say Norway, to get a feel for the land. Um, how did you choose Norway? Yeah, so I guess, so the, the kingdom of Leosland is, is kind of inspired by Norway, but it's also just kind of inspired by, um, by Iceland and by the Faroe Islands and by that kind of whole um, Scandinavian region. So um, I didn't I didn't travel there um, to write the book, but I did do a fair bit of research into kind of the geography and the sort of folklore and culture of the region because I wanted to kind of come up with a country that would feel like it belonged there. Um, like it's not it's not really based on anywhere specific other than kind of Scandinavia broadly. Like it's not kind of like a fantasy version of Norway or a fantasy version of Iceland or anything like that. I wanted to kind of have like the geography of Iceland. So the volcanoes, the black sand beaches, the mountains, all that kind of stuff, but be, and it be at the same latitude. So be subarctic, have that kind of subarctic climate, but it's about the size of the Faroe Islands and it's just off the coast of Norway. So I kind of did research into those three, um, those three countries and those three regions and tried to kind of come up with something that would feel real and that would feel lived in. Um, so yeah, so that was my primary, that was my primary approach and my primary goal with, um, with Leo's land. But I would love to go to Scandinavia one day. I haven't been, but you know, hopefully I will eventually. Same. Um, okay, so here, this is a dumb question. Do you believe in fairies? Um, I believe. I'm open-minded. <laughs> I wouldn't say like, I mean, I, I would like to, I would love to believe in fairies. Um, and I've definitely had kind of like some interesting, um, I don't know, like I, I went to Ireland when I was quite young, like when I was in my early twenties and I spent a decent amount of time there. And there are definitely aspects of the landscape there that feel um, almost kind of like like alive in a strange way or almost kind of watchful when you're there and I definitely remember a very sort of like haunted feeling about some of the landscapes there and I would love to attribute that to this idea of being watched by fairies um malevolent or not I don't really care I just think that would be awesome um but yeah I certainly I certainly am open to the possibility of fairies let's just say that same same and I, <laughs> I spent time in um in Scotland and they, yeah, I was like, I'm not sure that we got fairies in Texas, 
But let me tell you, I'm, I, I absolutely believe there's a good possibility. Scotland's if they're there. anywhere, they're there. Yeah. <laughs> real. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Angie says, I couldn't quite place the scale for the different sizes of fairies. How big is Poe? Yeah, Poe is quite small. Um, I think that Poe doesn't, like, if you were standing, he wouldn't quite come up to your knee, but he would perhaps be almost at about that height. So yes, he's he's very little, but he's definitely like, he has a presence <laughs> when you see him. And he is, of course, despite being very small, he is um, rather scary. Uh, he has basically like um, like needle knife type situations for, for fingers. So yeah, you want to be careful of Poe, even though he is quite small. I, I loved that his wife was wearing a possible fur made out of human skin. And she was just <laughs> like, well, I'm just not going to look too close. That's yeah. just how they do. <laughs> That's, that's just the fashion. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jamie asks also a great question. I loved the, uh, the frenzied overworked fairies at the, uh, the very end and the dress designs, like the, uh, the, the eight hedgehogs that were in the pockets. Did those details mm -hmm. just come to you? Yeah, I love, I love, I love the hedgehogs in the pockets. Um, I don't know where that came from. I wish I did because that was, that was a fun detail. I had fun with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that I just like, to me, having that kind of sort of chaotic um, picture of like fairy folklore where there's just these kinds of weird random details um, that just are kind of there. Um, I, I love that. And I think that that kind of gets back to what we were talking earlier about fairy tales and about how, you know, someone will just suddenly like turn into a duck, you know, or they'll turn into a swan. And it's just kind of a thing that happens. And I think that that's really prevalent in a lot of folklore. And so I think that's probably why I wanted to kind of mirror that aspect of like just weird random stuff just kind of popping up all over the place. So that last story about the ravens, is that just like a bonus story or is that some sort of foreshadowing of something to come um it's it was definitely a bonus story um it might be a foreshadowing of something to come I don't know but um yeah I just kind of I had that idea and I thought about including it as a footnote um that was my initial idea but it just felt like it was something that was a bit bigger than a footnote and it was something that really kind of gets at Wendell's character and like who he is in a way that um, I just wanted to give more space to. And fortunately, my publisher was amenable to me kind of having it as sort of like a bonus story at the end. So yeah, that's that's why that kind of slotted in there. Oh, I'm glad you did because that, that was one of my, my favorites of, of all of them in there. Um, oh, thank you. There's also, you mentioned in a couple of times in the footnotes, uh, I'm going to remember the name wrong. I want to say Danielle de Grey. Is mm. that like a, a made up person in your universe or is that somebody actually, cause I was like, I don't know who that is. Is that, was that an actual right. researcher? Um, yeah. She, so Danielle de Grey, um, she is definitely, she was, she was someone who, um, She's obviously not a real person in the real world, but um, she was a real person in Emily's world. Um, she disappeared a number of decades before um, the events of, of Emily Wilde. And um, yeah, so she she was um, she was kind of a dryologist like Emily, and she kind of went missing um, in this particular region of the Alps and was never heard from again, which is a common fate for dryologists. It's a it's a very um, it's a very dangerous profession. Um, to get involved in <laughs> and hello kitty and um, yeah so I mean we might we might see more of her um, but as of the events of Emily Wilde she her her disappearance is still a mystery so all right very interesting yeah as I was reading it I was like is this is this like a morality tale at the end so that she knows mm. like oh it's this is dangerous Emily be careful or is this yeah okay awesome right uh, let's see. Um, Kelly said, yep, 100%. I could totally see this being turned into a movie. Any talk Ooh. of that? Oh, uh, yeah, that would be pretty cool. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't really have any news about that right now. Um, that would definitely be awesome. Or even just like an anime. Like I would love the idea of an anime version of, of Emily Wilde. That would be so much fun. Um, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see. The, um, as I was reading it for some reason, uh, have you ever read Laura Olympus, the graphic novel? I don't think so. No, it's very good. Um, I love it. It's uh, it's a graphic novel. It started as a webtoon, and it's just sort of a mm. mythic reimagining of um, 
oh my God, who is it? Hades and uh, Persephone, but it's more modern. And the, but the way that it's done is just, it's so good. And it's so, the banter is so good. And it's so funny as I was reading it, I pictured it in my head with that same uh, type of, um, what is it called? It's not animation, uh, illustration? No, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. I don't have my words, but um <laughs> yeah, you should read that too. Put that on your list. Uh, I'm going to put that on my list alongside <laughs> Sandman. <laughs> Let's see. Um, was there any uh, point where you were planning on writing the story one way and then the story was like, nope, I'm going a different way altogether? Yes, absolutely there was. Um, and I talked about this a little bit more before where um, I kind of describe myself as a planter. And um, so I do allow my outlines to kind of fall by the wayside if I find that there is um, a story, a good story reason for it. And if I feel like the characters have kind of grown in a way that I haven't really, that I didn't anticipate before I sat down to write. So yeah, actually Emily Wilde, um, it was gonna have a different ending. Um, and Wendell was actually going to be a slightly different kind of character initially. I didn't, anticipate him as being as much of a good guy as I think he is like he definitely has his dark side um for sure and he is from this realm which is known for some very nasty folk um but he was a little bit different in my head when I initially envisioned him but then when I kind of threw him into the story and he made his appearance there with Emily I kind of realized that oh okay actually no he's 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 this person he's not actually the person that I was imagining and so that required the story to take a little bit of a turn in a different direction and to kind of go somewhere else um but it felt very organic and so I just kind of went with it and on the whole I was happier with that direction the one that I had originally come up with because I felt like it was a bit more, a bit more original and a bit less like what we normally see from from fairy stories. So yeah, and and Wendell is is different from I think a lot of the fairies that we tend to see as kind of like romantic leads in these types of books. And so I really like kind of honoring that aspect of him and just letting him kind of do his weird thing and become his sort of weird, the weird character that he is. And so yeah, that was a lot of fun. And I and again, if I hadn't had that kind of leeway that I had allowed myself if I was still kind of stuck in Potter mode I think I probably would have missed that so one of one of my favorite um scenes is the uh the one where he has such a good time cutting off the head of the guy and that it makes such a satisfying plop that he rewinds <laughs> it so he can do it again and then yes. he decides to do it <laughs> a third time because you know three is the the magic number and then he's like oh, right no, the, she's throwing up I okay I guess I won't do it um it's, it's, cool so, a bit. <laughs> it's so it's dark it's funny you get this idea of like like this adorable playfulness but also mixed with what yeah. what <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you absolute psycho. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and then Kelly has uh, actually a really good question, which is, um, and we're almost at the end of our hour, so it's actually a great end question. Um, what other characters, if you can tell us, from the first book will be in the second book besides Emily mm -hmm. and Wendell? Is there anybody else that we can look forward to seeing again? Um, yeah, I mean, should I give this? Yeah, I'll just, I'll give a bit of a spoiler. So we do see Poe again. Um, I couldn't leave Poe behind. Yeah, <laughs> Poe is probably one of my favorite characters from book one. So yeah, I just, I had to, I had to find a way to include him um, because I just wanted to see him again. And again, I'm kind of guided by my own interests as a reader when I'm writing my books. So yeah, Poe does come back, possibly another character or two, but I'll just leave it at Poe. I think that should hopefully satisfy people. <laughs> If you have Poe and you have Shadow and uh, mm -hmm. there's the possibility of a cat, a terrible cat that may or may not yeah. actually be a cat and might be something <laughs> much worse, who knows? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think we're all 100% in. Um, Excellent. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for writing mm -hmm. this amazing, fantastic book. You answered not all of my questions, because I still have a lot of them, but most of them say bikini dog. So it's probably good that you're not actually answering all of the, I mean, honestly, what, what in the world, what am I even, who knows? Yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure there's any characters in my book that you would necessarily want to see in a bikini, but that was, I've never had that one before, so I appreciate that. I mean, you never know, you never know.
Um, well, this was fantastic. This was so much fun. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, um, everybody out there in 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 internet land for joining. Yeah. Oh, I, my my husband and child just pulled up. I can hear the I can hear the garage <laughs> door open. This is perfect timing. We have our next book is uh what did I do with it? Oh, I don't have one because I read the electronic version, so I don't have one. Um, but it's uh Mame, which should be coming to you soon. What's today? It should be yeah. The ninth, yeah, should be coming out soon. Um, and the uh, if you join Nightmares from Nowhere, Spite House will be shipping out soon. And uh, let's see, what is the have we announced next month's book? What is next month's book? Wait, let me see. Let me see what it is. Maybe I'll maybe I'll do a special announcement right now, or maybe I won't. I don't know. Let's see. It is. Okay, I'm not 100% sure that we, we have got this book, so I'm not going to say 100%, um, but if it is the book, it is lovely and funny and um, and uh, nonfiction, which is something we haven't done in a little in a little bit, and then also our um, horror book is, oh, really, really good, and I don't know that we have that one yet. I always have to check first to make sure that they can give us enough, um, so I never want to be like, oh, it's this book, and then have the publisher go, but we can't give you that many. We try to pick books that aren't necessarily going to be big, big books. They're not going to get like as much attention as as we want. And so it's it's a weird line, you know, where it's you want somebody where they're going to be like, yeah, we love selling an extra, you know, a thousand, two thousand books, but not somebody who goes, you've taken all of our books. Now no one else in the world can have them. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, you'll get an email soon. Um, so thank you again, Heather. Thank you yeah. for being here. This thank you so fun. much for having me. This is so much fun. And thank you so much to everyone who asked your questions. It was really nice chatting with you tonight. So yeah, really appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. And thank you, Vicki, for making this work and the behind the scenes. <laughs> thank the you, Vicki. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Take care of your